Good afternoon, everyone. We'll be getting started in a few minutes, please. for the children of this great city say good afternoon. Good afternoon. All right, how's everybody doing? This is a wonderful occasion today, just because of the nature of who is in the room and because of the nature of what we are gathering to talk about. My name is Chas Howard. I'm the university chaplain here at the University of Pennsylvania, and it is my delight and my joy to welcome you to the 2009 Albert M. Greenfield Memorial Lecture. This lecture and gathering really are quite a fitting tribute to Dr. Greenfield, a man who uh, in a recent documentary was described as Mr. Philadelphia, known as a businessman, real estate developer, a board man who served on more than 40 different boards, and a philanthropist. We would be remiss if we did not honor the Albert M. Greenfield Foundation and the members of the family, especially President and Ms. Priscilla Luce, who are the reason why we are gathering today. Thank you so much for your generosity and for your <laughs> It's become almost cliche to say it, but it takes a village to raise a child. And there are several members of the village of Philadelphia present this afternoon who need to be acknowledged before we introduce our presenter and respondent. Anyone here who is an educator, teacher, or an administrator in school, please stand up and let's acknowledge you. Thank you so much. Anyone here who works in community service or the nonprofit sector? Please stand up. We saw some uh, government and administrators here from the school board. Are right, anyone here from uh, City Hall or administrators? <laughs> Please stand up. Uh, I know there's some folks from our faith-based and religious congregation. I know White Rock Baptist is, is deep in the house to support their fellow congregation. <laughs> Any religious folks here? Please could you rise so we can acknowledge you too. several administrators and faculty here at the university as well as students. Uh, could you please rise and, and acknowledge your presence too? Thank you so much. It is my distinct honor and privilege to introduce Dr. John Fantuso, the Albert M. Greenfield Professor of Human Relations here at the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Fantuso's research and work has focused on the design, implementation, and the evaluation of school and community-based strategies for young, low-income children in high-risk urban settings. Having held teaching appointments at Fuller Graduate School of Psychology, the University of Rochester, Cal State Fullerton, he came to the University of Pennsylvania's Grad School of Education in 1988. Since coming to Penn, he's been involved in a number of federally funded research projects that involved extensive work with the School District of Philadelphia's early childhood educational programs. His publications, research projects, courses taught, and awards won are a testament to a career dedicated to improving the lives of our kids. Now, to most in this room, he's known as Professor or Dr. Fantuzo. But around my house, he's called something different. He's called Papa. This is my father-in-law. And any time he comes to, to be with his granddaughters who are way in the back of the room, drawing and coloring by the tree back there, <laughs> they place a high demand on him to tell stories. And he's famous for his stories because of the imagination that it brings up in, in my girls. He challenges them to think of worlds where they're riding with princes and they're princesses and they're going to castles with animals that can talk and he's really just feeding and, and blessing their imagination. Isn't that why we're gathered today? For imagination's sake. 
are we gathered today to imagine a world where every kid gets a wonderful education, where all the pressures from around the world that are impairing, hindering our kids get pushed out of the way so that they can get a full education, be who they want to be, so that their imaginations, so that they can be whatever they want, they can do whatever they want. That's what you all are doing. And that's what Dad is going to speak to us about today. Our lecture this afternoon is bringing us together for this special moment to focus our attention on the educational well-being of African-American boys, both nationally and especially locally. Today, Dr. Fantuzzo, through his research findings, will draw our attention to this important group of Philadelphia citizens and will challenge us to see how we can take steps to foster their educational well-being. The title of the 2009 Greenfield Memorial Lecture is The Educational Well-Being of African-American Boys. After Dr. Fantuzzo's lecture, we'll have two wonderful respondents who will introduce more thoroughly soon our superintendent, Dr. Arlene Mackin, and the deputy mayor of health and opportunity in the city of Philadelphia, Dr. Don Schwartz. But before that, please join me in welcoming Dr. John Fantuzzo. I trust you will be able to judge my heart from this presentation and that the benefits of my work for African American boys will speak for themselves. As the this, as this saying goes, you'll judge the tree uh, by its fruit. And so I'll stand on that. Um, as Reverend Howard stated, our focus today is on a group of African American boys drawn from an important policy relevant cohort of children in Philadelphia. The 2005-2006 third grade cohort is the first group of children in the school district to be assessed by the state standardized No Child Left Behind assessment system. This cohort is over 12,000 children who were born and raised in Philadelphia. And two distinguishing facts, about 70% of that third grade cohort uh, is in poverty, lives in poverty. And important for our talk today is that one out of three is an African-American boy. An overall look at the academic and behavioral indicators of concern across Caucasian boys and African-American boys shows some significant gaps and cause for concern for the educational well-being of African-American boys. You can see basically that 62% of the boys and 45% of the boys are not proficient in reading and math, uh, respectively. Uh, over a third um, experienced uh, uh, were recorded as truant, and one out of 10 uh, of the children were uh, suspended in that, in that year. So those are, that's, cause for, that's cause for us for concern. But before we proceed, I want to stop for a moment to contrast two different perspectives on these statistics that really reflect conditions of the heart. One perspective, which I'm afraid is a dominant perspective, is a, is a perspective that's dominated by fear and hopelessness. It's a perspective that involves people focusing solely on deficiencies, blaming, detached, uninvolved, seemingly unconcerned about someone else's children. That perspective is not a perspective that we want in the city of Philadelphia to have. That's a perspective that's unfortunately a common perspective. The contrasting perspective is a perspective that operates out of hope and love in community. Now that, if you take me there, that could be a hallmark card, but we've got to really translate what it really means in reference to hope, out of hope and love in community. Because to operate out of hope and love in community, we will need to examine the conditions of our hearts. We will need to have the eyes of our hearts open, and then we can uh, 
move together strategically as a community to work uh, with our children. And it's important to me that this gathering today uh, is a gathering that represents broadly the, the, the elders of the village. Chavis was talking about a village. It represents the elders of the village. But we elders don't necessarily come together really often and uh, join together in full community. So they, we want, I want to challenge you uh, with that a little bit today. But as they say, a picture is worth 10,000 words. This picture here is the, uh, is the picture that's the inspiration of this talk. These, uh, this picture are three brothers that are, come from a very special Head Start family that I had the pleasure of working with early in the 1990s. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about them later. But I want you to open the eyes of your heart and you tell me what you see in this picture. Okay? If you're like me, you're drawn to those eyes. As they say, the eyes are the window of the soul. These are beautiful living souls. Vibrant spirits, eager to learn and to embrace life. Well, what do we want to do for these beautiful souls? I would hear a, an amen here if you were in my church. You would hear a strong amen. What we want to do is we want to encourage them. We want to embrace them. We want to give them the best of what we have to offer. Last year, I had the privilege of hearing Dr. Dandala, the General Secretary of the All-African Council of Churches, preach at White Rock Church, which is, which is my church. The title of his sermon was, Blessed Are the Poor. So I was prepared to hear sort of like terrible stories uh, about poverty in Africa. Well, Dr. Dandela spoke of the realities. I wasn't shy about speaking of the realities of poverty in Africa. But his primary purpose was to bless us with a powerful image from one of the poorest villages in Africa. The significant, the significant picture that he shared with us, I want to share with you as the invocation of what I, the research I want to share. It was a significant event in this village where the village elders came together and they brought their cows that they were contributing to help actually provide meat for the community. So this event was butchering of the cows to prepare meat for the whole village. This was a celebration much like Thanksgiving. They were coming together. Well, in the midst of this celebration, the elders of the village would come together the elders of the village would call out the little boys one by one and they would place their hands on their head in a solemn manner and say, son, you will have many cows and you will be a responsible person and contribute much to our village. The boys stood tall and the elders' hands, on, with the elders' hands on their head and afterwards they walked a little bit taller and more upright. They did not have cows at that time, but they had the confidence and hope of their village and a pledge of support from their village for, the, for their future well-being. This is what our task is as a village. And I want to basically share with you some of work that testifies that this village really does its work. And we're going to talk about a story of challenges and possibilities. Well, we have two primary foci here. One foci is for us to basically make visible what's behind being behind. Because there are reasons why good people are behind, and that's because they're facing tremendous challenges. There's a big ball, and there's a steep hill that they're facing that we need to understand and learn about. The other thing that we have to do is that we have to enhance our expression of love is enhancing these little ones. We have to give them the skills that they need to be successful. More than that, we have to get them to be excited about the dance of learning that we want them to participate in for all the days of their lives. So this is basically our purpose, success. And we, in order for us to do this, we have to be conscious of differences and responsive to those differences. We have to be conscious of the individual different developmental differences of children, as, as competent educators are aware of, but we also have to be responsible for the rich cultural and family differences and make sure that we don't get in the way of those differences, but that we celebrate those differences. 
But we also have to have an MO. We have to have a modus operandi. How are we going to get this done? Well, I, I take a look at basically what I've across my uh, three decades of working um, with many mandates that come from Washington, and hopefully that's going to change. But these national mandates, mes mandates come out. And then the first thing that we do is do. Like we do. When the mandates come out, we do. And then after we do, guess what else we do? We do some more. So I, I affectionately call this my do do slide. <laughs> because what's wrong with this picture? is that we're doing a lot without knowing what we're doing. And it's very important, and I'm, this is a moment of bragging for the researchers, it's really important for us to know something about what we're doing. Now, in, in truth, the researchers are a little bit too late with their findings, so we've got to get them to get faster. But we need to know. You know, I'm not comfortable with this picture either. I'm not comfortable with this picture. Because we're knowing after we're doing. Really what we have to do is we eat, we have to know, and then with what we know, we have to plan, and then we have to do. So it's we know, plan, do. Not we know, can do. <laughs> the purpose I, I want to share with you in some highlights of, of three studies that basically addresses these important needs for knowledge. How do we make visible the impact of risks on the educational well-being of children? How do we make visible protective factors that are necessary to reduce the risks to help the children make the ball smaller, help the children function? And then how do we intentionally and systematically improve the quality of the protective factors for our most vulnerable children? This is our, this is our task. These are our mandates. Well, in order to basically affect those mandates, we have to build capacities that are really good capacities that will allow us to collect that knowledge. So I'm going to tell, talk to you about three capacities that have been built. And I wish I could take, I wish I could take, uh, although I, I, I probably would be uh, 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 not comfortable taking the credit, but the question is, each of these capacities represents scores of people who came together in uncommon collaboration to do things that no one had done before. So that the Kids Integrated Data System, the Early Care and Education Interview, and the Evidence-Based evidence -based Program for Integrated Curricula, EPIC. The Integrated Data System model is really, uh, basically, there's so many people who are involved. The school district, the city, I'm looking and I'm seeing the people who are involved in this audience. A point that you should take great pride in. The university, the William Penn Foundation, the city and the school district came together to produce one of the, one of the first in the nation integrated data systems to identify risks and improve public services. One of the problems is all these agencies have their own data and their silos, another, another big word, right? So the question is the integrated data system created knowledge across the silos because the dear souls, the children, exist in all of that information, not within only a reality of the silo. So the integrated data system provides ca uh, capacity to integrate records across all public agencies serving children and to provide ready um, data sets to basically answer big questions. Well, we had a big question, and the big question was we wanted to know all the different risks. What's behind being behind? What were the factors that were actually um, affecting the educational progress of our third grade cohort, and particularly our African American boys? So what we did is we were able to gather across, because of the good work and the collaboration of our city and school district colleagues, we were able to integrate data across the Department of Human Services, the Office of Supportive Housing, the Department of Health, um, the school district, um, to basically get a look at each of these variables. Because each of these variables are known risk factors to children's development. So we integrated them for, th for 12,000 kids. And we were able to, with such a large, and I'm speaking to the researchers now, uh, my, my nerd convention of, of researchers, <laughs> Uh, we researchers just love data, and I'm looking at Mike because he loves data too. We researchers love data. We like lots of data. We like lots of uh, uh, participants. So with this data set being so large, we were able to do sophisticated um, models 
Now, the only good thing about the sophisticated model that I would share with the non-statisticians in the audience is that you can be smarter and more precise about what you say if you have everything in the model, because you're controlling for everything instead of speaking from the silo. So we want to basically say, well, let's control for poverty. Or people could say, oh, it's all poverty, it's all this, it's all that. Now let's control for those things, and let's see if there's a unique effect of uh, child maltreatment on a specific type of outcome. So this is our nerdy models, and we're looking at likelihood, significant likelihood of risk. So we want to look at the unique effects of risk. We also wanted to look at the cumulative effects and the interactive effects. It's a little bit more complicated look. But we wanted to look at the unique effects of those risks. What we found is basically we found these health-related risks, each of them independently, were related to poor reading and poor math outcomes. Not the behavioral outcomes, but the academic outcomes. So lead toxicity was significantly related to poor math and poor reading. Uh, <coughs> controlling for all the other variables in the model. So this was a pattern of our outcomes. What we found with the family risk factors, homelessness, teen mom, low maternal education, child maltreatment, they were all significantly related to all of the behavioral outcomes. They significantly predicted kids who were going to be truant, who were going to have conduct problems in school, and who were going to have a school suspension. They were all independently significantly related. Now there were some risks that were related to both academic outcomes and uh, behavioral outcomes. Child, so they were being like, come to the top of our list of ones we would want to target. Child maltreatment, homelessness, low maternal education. Those were really related to all of the risk factors in, in the population. We then wanted to take a look at the prevalence of these risks in our cohort. Now, I was particularly looking at the African American boys <coughs> and the other boys uh, in our cohort. So what you see in the blue there these are the national prevalence, the national prevalence or percentages of these risks in the overall child population. Teen mom, uh, homelessness, maltreatment, blood toxicity. Now I'm going to show you the prevalence of the African American boys and all the other boys in this third grade cohort. So the African American boys are in red and you can see the, the prevalence of these risks are tremendous. So you want to say what's behind being behind? Those risks are behind being behind. Those risks, which we've demonstrated effectively relate to outcomes, those risks occur in high percentages for our kids. And so we want to make them visible, and we want to basically go after those risks. I was particularly interested in homelessness because that's distinctively related to the African-American boys. You see homelessness there? Uh, the other boys are not. Lead is pretty high for African-American boys but it's also high for the other boys. Homelessness is particularly uh, a, a focus there, and I know we have people from the Office of, of Supportive Housing here. But I wanted to say, so, okay, you, you researchers, you statisticians, whatever, you're good at statistics and pointing out numbers, but what the heck do we do with this stuff? Okay, that we know, plan, do. So the question is, we can take these data and we can now map these data onto all 173 elementary schools and take a look at triaging the elementary schools for any of these risks or all of them. So we can basically take a look, like the purple dots are the schools with, with only 0 to 9 percent homelessness rates. And the big red dots have homelessness rates for third graders up to 32 percent. Now, Okay, if we were deploying our resources, right? We would want to deploy our resources strategically. So that's why we have to have the nerdy data that actually helps us say how can we use this information? How can we create unique collaborations among uh, uh, sh uh, shelter, uh, shelters and workers in working with homelessness and those elementary school principals and those, those folks? So you get, you get what we could do. But well, we're not settled, we're not happy with risk factors. I, I'm really sad that in our administrative databases, we have more bad news than good news. But we as a village need to create good news in our administrative data systems. And I want to show you an illustration of where some courageous people have, have participated in creating good news. That is, we need to make <coughs> visible protective factors community-wide. 
Now, what we did, because obviously Head Start is one of the most important responses nationally to children in poverty, we really looked at how could we create a system of collecting public information on children who have had an early childhood experience prior to kindergarten. Before 2000, the school district did not have a reliable and valid way of taking a look at the nature and type of early childhood experiences. So basically, a very courageous director of, of uh, kindergarten, who's here today, Dr. Stephanie Childs, uh, basically was willing to partner with nerdy researchers. And we put together, a we developed a structured parent-teacher interview system and validated it. And um, Dr. Childs and the leadership at the time basically said, let's give the kindergarten teachers one full week without children to carefully interview um, the parents and collect this information. So policy changes were made to benefit to collect this information. And I'm also happy to say that at that time it cost 10 cents per child to gather the information. So now, with this information, we can take a look as formal early care significantly reduced the risks for poor outcomes for Philadelphia kids. So you've got those dear little souls coming into the kindergarten. And we can take a look at what the protective influence is of a formal early childhood uh, experience. Well, we've got mixed results. When we entered this into the models, we basically found that we, it was significant for reducing risks for reading, math, and truancy, but not for those behavioral outcomes. Um, as a matter of fact, it wasn't as strong for math as it was for reading, because early childhood and early education has been putting a lot of emphasis on literacy. And they've been doing a really good job, and our, our government has produced decades and decades of research money into literacy. So we know a lot about literacy, and it's been applied. We need to know a lot more about math, and we need to know a lot more about teaching uh, children positive behaviors in classrooms. So I'm going to put a pin in that and come back to that in its relationship to integrated curriculum. Okay. Does the positive influence of formal early care hold up for African American boys who are experiencing each of those risks? So let's take a look. Let's take a look at all the African American boys in our cohort who were preemies pre with low birth weight, and let's divide them into two categories, the kids who had formal care and the kids who did not have formal care. You with me? Now let's take a look at their reading proficiency. The kids who had formal care who also were low birth weight, had a significantly higher level, greater percentage of them were reading proficient than the kids who did not have that, that early childhood experience. And if we take a look at that across the board, we see basically the kids with those early childhood experiences, even though they had been maltreated, even though they were homeless, were actually uh, had higher reading proficiency scores. When we take a look at truancy, we take a look at all the kids who were homeless, and we look at the percentage of all the kids who were homeless, African American boys who were homeless, those who had early childhood experiences and those who did not. The red is those who did not. And then we basically see that it was protective for the kids who were homeless, and also for these others. That is, the kids with an early care experience had reduced levels of truancy. But how about the amount of risk? Okay, we're talking about each of these risks, and we have the ability to look at them. But how about the sheer amount of them? Regardless of what type of risk, how about the amount of them? Well, this line here at the, this line here at the top is basically the proficiency level. So maybe I have a fancy thing I could point to. Oh, there we go. Well, there's my fancy point. Okay, so below that, the children were not proficient. Okay, so that line there is the proficiency level for reading. Okay, so let's take a look at the kids with different amounts of risks. So we can see with kids with zero amount of risks are above the proficiency level. But look at two, one, two, and three or more. It's a steady downward decline in terms of the amount of risk. So these are all the kids who had no early childhood experience, all the African American boys with no early childhood experience. Let's take a look at the African American boys with the same amounts of risks who had an early childhood experience. The good news, or well, the bad news, is that they're parallel. They go down. The risks, the amount of risk affect them. But it's parallel. 
that they're basically, there's a buffering effect for them at each amount of risk level. And the kids with one risk, you see it right there at the borderline for proficiency. But we're really concerned about the children who, who experience a whole bunch of risks. Aren't you most concerned about those three or more kids? So we need to turn the microscope up on those kids. And what we need to do is we need to take a careful look and study them carefully. What we find in this cohort of African American boys, 75% of them were not proficient in reading. But there were 25 who had three or more risk, 25% who were proficient in reading. Those kids we need to know more about. Those kids and their families are resilient. They're beating the odds. We need to know more about them. Well, we had our magnifying glass on early childhood, so we could look at that. And you're not going to be surprised that 80% of those children had a formal early childhood experience. Now, we need to create more protective factors, community, village, that we can actually create so we can study and enhance. But we've got early childhood, and we've got incredibly competent people in early childhood in the city, so let's enhance early childhood, okay? So we're going to do our third thing. How do we make good better? We're not satisfied with good for our children. And I'm thinking in terms of my church, nothing but the best we want. Nothing but the best. Our pastor says frequently, God requires nothing but your best. So we want nothing for the, but the best. So we have to improve the quality of early childhood education. We've got to roll up our sleeves. Lots of people together. Let's take our look at early childhood education. What are the key targets? We have to improve our assessment. Our assessment is our intelligence on the children. We have to improve our curriculum. It's what we do. And we have to support educators, and we have to get families connected to the dance. That's our charge, right? So it really has these basic components. Assessment, what do, what do we know about children's skills? Curriculum, what do we do to advance those skills based on what we know? And professional development is how the heck do we help the teachers use best practices to face these challenges? Well, we really, we, we've got a whole chunk of money from the federal government. Their, their souls are good for something. We've got a bunch of money from them. And we, um, we came together with a group of highly competent Head Start teachers. Some of them are here in this room. And we're actually going to see a video of, of, of uh, two of them. Teachers and teacher assistants, we brought together the genius of Philadelphia to basically create Dr. Gadsden, my, my partners, Dr. Gadsden and Dr. McDermott. We came together with our Head Start partners to put this program together. And this program is called EPIC, uh, not to be confused with the Homeric legend of the journey, although we felt like that. The, the trick here is in the adjective. Because assessment can be a pain in the backside. It can be top down, it can be for government work, it can be not reliable and valid for the kids you work with. So the notion for us is we've got to have useful assessment. Useful assessment is assessment that's comprehensive and measures individual differences for the kids you're working with. It has to monitor progress so we can actually see growth, duh. And it has to inform what people do. It has to provide the intelligence for the teachers to guide the teachers' activities. Otherwise, it's useless. We need integrated curriculum. We can't leave out a skill. Right now, we're kind of leaving out that behavior. And duh, we're getting kids in a lot of trouble. Okay? It really makes me upset. There's one thing that, well, there are many things that make me upset. This is one of my chief peeves is that is we work really hard. We recognize that kids are coming to Head Start without prerequisite reading skills. We learn that from our research. So what do we do? We teach the prerequisite reading skills. Guess what? The children are coming to Head Start without prerequisite behavioral learning behavior skills. And then what do we do? We don't teach them, we manage them. We manage them. And I think the reason why we don't teach them is because the teachers don't necessarily know, have a curriculum to teach them or don't know how to teach them. So what we do is we have to manage them. So we don't want to be educators and then zookeepers. We want to be educators and educators. So we want to educate. So we need to have a robust, integrated curriculum. Guess what? Math is useful out there. 
Being able to control yourself and affect what you want to do and be able to work with other people and regulate yourself is probably the most important thing. I'm trying to regulate myself so I get this done in a timely fashion. And that's what you most care about. I know our pastor says that too. That let's look in at our watch. The sermon is going to be done when I'm done. Right? I don't have as much power as Pastor Shaw, so I've got to be done on time. It also has to be intensive. You, if you take a look at Head Start research, one of the things you find is that there's a lot of transitions. People are going to the bathroom, people are eating, people are walking around. And there's a small amount of time that's focused on actually learning. We've got to redeem the day. We've got to basically make sure that everybody's dancing and we're using the whole classroom because we can't afford to shortchange those kids for a learning experience. They ain't got the time. They need us to be the best. So we have to have curricula that are robust. We also have to make connections with the family. Forget this, family involvement is contacting the family. No, family involvement is dancing with the home educators who got the real power. How do we integrate into the curriculum ways in which weekly home educators can dance the same dance that the educators in the classroom are dancing? And who knows where those educators are coming from? It may be a Sunday school teacher. Who cares? Are the powerful educators in that child's community? That's what we want to connect to. The other thing, another adjective, is learning community. We've got a lot of communities, but we need them to be learning communities. We need to enhance the competency and efficacy of our educators. Because to give them a robust assessment and to give them a robust integrated curricula We've got to give them a lot of support. We've got to basically give them a community where they can share best practices, where they can be supported for collaborative learning, where we can promote the genius in those learning workforces. How do we promote leadership? Well, the epic is we know, plan, do. We as a community need to take the assessment so we know where the children are. We need to plan based on our knowledge of the children, and we need to perform really well and hit the mark for it in community. So intentional, systematic, and in community, that's what EPIC was designed to do. Um, did we connect and be engaged, teachers and teacher assistants? And I'm not telling you, although I would love to think this, in my most narcissistic moment, I'd love to think that we've solved all the world's problems. But I'm really not showing you EPIC as it's it. I'm showing you EPIC as a model of what collaboration produced when folks said, we can do. And I want to show you how these teachers responded to anonymous surveys throughout the year. And teacher and teacher assistants, the blue line is the percent that they were satisfied with what they were doing unit by unit. Okay? Okay, I, you know, like whatever. I mean, if we could even ask you if you were satisfied with what you ate for dinner last night, even though you cooked it, would you give it such a high satisfaction rating? Then it, and then it, the other line is their curriculum fidelity. That is, how faithfully did they implement the curriculum as it was designed, co-constructed by educators? So we were really encouraged. But now the rubber meets the road is that the children's outcome. That's where it is, right? The children's outcomes. So I want to basically let you know that we did all the nerdy, randomized control field experiments that the government requires. We randomly found 96 classrooms. We worked with 1,700 children. And the exciting news is that we found significant differences favoring the EPIC program for math differences, for literacy and language differences. And we found that those important learning behaviors were associated with better outcomes. I want to show you, though, and we can dim the lights a little bit, Heather. I want to show you, though, and I hope uh, I, I hope Miss Lucky and Miss Lee are here. Miss Lucky and Miss Lee, are you here? Okay, I'm hoping. Oh, yeah, I see you. Okay, Miss Lucky and Miss Lee, who are just two wonderful, wonderful um, educators in our EPIC program. They're at a wonderful school, AB Day, under leadership of. Karen Dean, a wonderful principal there. And I want to show you a little clip, because you wouldn't believe me. You wouldn't believe me otherwise. Because you would say, uh, John, you know, you're a little bit hysterical. Uh, you wouldn't believe me. You're just enthusiastic overall. So seeing is believing, right? I want to show you a clip. This is a large group activity. 
And it's based on a, a book. So it's based on a literacy, it's based on a book, a wonderful book called Mouse Hunt. And so the kids in their large group are on a mouse hunt. But it's actually designed for math instruction and for learning behaviors. Intentionally, the teachers are working on math skills. They're working on counting, line counting, rope counting. They're working on number recognition. They're working on cardinality. And they're working on graphing. All in this short act activity. They're also working on learning behaviors. They're working on intentionally attention control, frustration tolerance, task approach, and group learning. The class is very diverse. There are babies in this classroom, just out of diapers, three or two, three years old, and there are kids going to kindergarten. It's a very diverse class. There are kids with special needs, ELL kids, so it's a really diverse class. But I want you to basically look at how engaged the students are and how engaged uh, the educators are in this brief clip. Are you ready? Okay. Yeah, don't we do our movement every day? Yeah. Stand up. Oh, never mind, never mind. Sit. Oh, come on, come on, stand up, stand up, stand up. Come on, come on, stand up. Now, <laughs> no. Simon says, touch your stomach. Simon says, touch your head. Simon says, touch your toes. Simon says, touch your head. Simon says, touch your toes. Simon says, touch your head. Simon says, touch your toes. Simon says, stop. Simon says, clap five times. One, two, three, four, five. Oh, Simon said, five. Simon says, jump. Seven times. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, stop. Oh. Ooh, seven. 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 Simon says, touch your knees. That's not your knees. Your knees. Simon says, head, shoulders, knees, and toes. 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 Okay. 
which color has the most? Five. Five. Very good. Give yourselves a pat on that. Which group has the least amount? Look again. Use your detective eyes. Sit down, sit down, sit down. Wait, which number has the lowest number? Which, which is the one that's the smallest number? Because it has the least. One, right. One is has the least. So there's a lot. So we have a lot. What number is missing? Four. Four is missing. We didn't use four. But that, our graph tells us a lot about our class. Okay, what you see, first of all, what you should be looking to see how connected those kids are. Even the little babies are connected and following the teachers. And how Miss L Lucky and Miss Lee are connecting with those kids, are loving those kids, are connecting with them every minute, every opportunity. And those little ge math geniuses, they weren't just doing rote counting. They were basically doing mathematical reasoning. They were identifying numbers that weren't there. They were basically combining and counting. And you didn't see the little ones not part, but they were included in a very, very supportive way. I sort of love this little clip, and you can go to Epic Classrooms and see folks working intensively, and it's the dance of learning, that everyone's in the dance, everyone's a participant, everyone's successful, and they're really making progress. So what, is, what, what did we basically find in terms of Epic about our African American boys in terms of their overall math performance? We really found the African American boys who were in Epic, the blue line, really showed a different trajectory than the African-American boys who were not in Epic and, and were in Head Start. So that that math training really made a difference to distinguish those African-American boys' knowledge. Do the African-American boys in Epic show comparable levels of progress in literacy and learning behaviors? Because we're talking about an integrated curriculum. Well, here's a picture of fall literacy rates. The, the green is the African-American boys and then the light blue is others. This is their fall literacy rates. Alphabetic knowledge, phonemic awareness, listening comprehension. The biggies in literacy. Let's take a look at where the kids are in terms of their skill levels in three months. So the African American boys not only caught up to where those other kids were, where they were slightly behind, but in some ways, they, in some ways they edged up above them for those literacy areas. But how about in those approaches to learning, you know? Remember we'd be, before we were saying there was no difference in early childhood and kids' behavior. Well, let's look at behavior. Attention control, frustration tolerance, and group learning. I'm sure in this audience we have people, my wife is here in the audience, and she can point to my attention control deficits and frustration tolerance and group learning deficits. All of us are challenged in these areas. So when we intentionally teach them, our African-American boys were slightly behind in the fall. But by the three months later of intentional, intensive instruction, they not only caught up, but look at frustration tolerance. Look at frustration tolerance. They not only caught up, but they edged up and showed more progress. Better response than some of the other kids to the training. They soaked up that training and used that training. How about the families? Every week in Epic, there is a family learning activity that's integrated into the curriculum. Do the African American boys show comparable levels of participation in weekly learning activities? That's a, that's a question. So we're going to look at the participation rate of all the Head Start families and look at those with African American boys and those without. This is the families of non-African American boys across the year. These are their participation rates of their turning in their, their, their family learning activities. So it's a pretty high level of participation rates. I would basically go to some of the Penn classrooms and see if homework is turned in at this level. <laughs> here, are the African, here are the families of African American boys. They are there exactly with the group, and in some cases leading the group on some units. We are so excited about their responsiveness to the training. So this is the best slide, right? Summary, conclusion, get this little guy off the stage. Okay. First of all, I want to just underscore when this sort of water ski of slides, I want to underscore 
we know, we have data because of the good work in Philadelphia, the challenges are real. They are substantial. We are the poorest large city in the United States. Okay? We have 24.5% of our households in poverty. I showed you that 70% of the third grade cohorts living in poverty. We've got our work cut out for us. The challenges are real. No sugar coating. But we can make risks visible community-wide. We can, we've demonstrated it, that we have the will to come together and not say, oh, we're DHS, we're really special, we're not going to share with Office of Housing, or we're the school district, we're not going to share information. No, we did the hard work, we figured out the legal issues, we figured out ways that we could share, and we can make risks visible. We can make visible positive influences like formal early care. We've got to make a whole host of them. How many have some wonderful protective factors? They'd like to see parent involvement, father involvement. Let's list them and let's go about making them visible. Maybe we can do it for five cents or ten cents a kid. Let's work on it. We can make quality improvements for our, that our boys and families respond to. If anything you get from this talk, I hope you walk away with the hope that we can do it. Not that the Penn people got it but that we can do it as a community and as a village. We are at a key moment of community responsibility. I, I think some of the theologians in this audience or the people who study Greek know that Greeks are really precise about their use of words. They have two words for time. Chronos, tick-tock, tick-tock, and kairos, that special, propitious, pregnant moment. I think without craziness that we are at a very kairos moment in this city. I think it's the attendance here today, although I'd love to think that it's because I'm so cute, but <laughs> the attendance here today is because of who my special discussants are. They are the reasons why you've come here. I hope we showed you what we've showed them, what we all can do in partnership. This is a moment for the village of Philadelphia. I know we have a mayor who's committed. We've got everyone. We've got a university that's willing to roll up its sleeves and actually operate from its billion dollar institution, from its, its, its resources. So what we need to do is we need to go to this image. I'm a picture person. We need to go to this image. This is as close as I could get to those, to those elders laying their hands on the little ones. Because it's all about who's touching the little hands. So everyone who's touching those little hands, what we have to do, this is the commitment. And I wish I could do a pledge card or something that you know our church is really good at. I wish I could do something where I got you to write something down. But we have to, as a village, translate threat into challenges. We can't be, oh, threats, oh, put them in the newspaper. No, we've got to translate them into challenges. We have to ch translate challenges into possibilities. And we have to take possibilities and produce real change for children. This is the only way that these hands are going to transmit hope for the children. They need real hope. They don't need the Hallmark card smile. They need real hope. And that hope is evident in the success we give them. You know what cows are for them? A college education. We want for these young boys. I told you we worked with these young boys. These young boys came from a very challenging environment. They had a mom, a single mom, who could basically, I wish she was on Obama's cabinet, this mom. She came into very challenging circumstances. She came into a head start to get everything she could from her children, for her children. And she basically worked with us on our team. She actually became actually a, a, a parent who was employed by Penn to work with our team. She came back about 12 years later. She was on a special project, the Play Buddy project that Dr. Childs was on. She came back. It was a collaboration between DHS and the school district, the Head Start program. She came back 12 years later to my office where this picture was hanging up on, on my door. And she said to me, Dr. Fantuzo, I wanted you to know that these little ones are in college. I I, I hugged that woman. I probably could have get arrested by the way I hugged her. I just hugged her. Oh, I, I just hugged her, thanked her so much. 
because we cannot be in a position where we say, we can't do this. We cannot. <clears throat> we want to be elders who say, you will have many cows. Thank you. <laughs>